VXLAN or Virtual Extensible Local Area Network is a network encapsulation mechanism that supports up to 16 million virtual network identifiers or VNIs. VXLAN is a data plane tunnel that provides both layer 2 and layer 3 network connectivity for the servers and virtual machines in different racks over an IP fabric. VXLAN allows traffic to be load shared across multiple equal cost paths in the physical IP underlay fabric. VXLAN supports both intra data center within the same DC and inter DC across the WAN. And any VXLAN capable device is considered a VTAP or a VXLAN tunnel endpoint device. So what are the benefits of overlay and underlay networking? Let's take a look. The overlay networks provide both layer 2 and layer 3 connectivity for virtual machines, containers, servers, routers or firewalls in different racks. They provide cloud agility because the virtual networks can be created quickly and easily by automation between the hardware and software VTAPs. And they scale beyond 4000 VLANs for multi-tenancy. For the underlay networks, we recommend a leaf and spine topology where the leaf switches connect to every spine switch. The spine switches basically function as an aggregator to connect all the leaf switches. Take note, the spine switches are not connected to each other. And this will provide a distributed, high-performance, scalable network fabric with equal latency for east-west traffic. From one leaf to another leaf, it's basically two hops away right, through any spine switch. And the failure of a single link, one spine or one leaf should not impact the rest of the fabric. So with a layer tree fabric, customers can get rid of span tree and achieve a loop-free multi-pathing network. Let's take a look at a few VXLAN VTAP use cases in the next few slides. In the software VTAP to software VTAP use case, you basically have hypervisors that are VXLAN capable, they can build tunnels between themselves, and these will provide VM with connectivity through the overlay network. So in this example, I have VMs on the same 10 subnet, and we have a layer 3 network in the middle. This VXLAN tunnel will provide network connectivity between VM1 and VM2. To take note, not all hypervisors have VTAP functionality. Additional software is typically required to be installed. Some examples, OpenStack, HPE Distributed Cloud Networking, VMware NSX are all capable of running software VTAPs. In a hardware VTAP to hardware VTAP use case, this basically supports servers that are not VXLAN capable, but the network team would like to run VXLAN to support layer two, connectivity over a layer 3 network. This provides connectivity for both the VMs and physical devices such as routers in different racks. So the Aruba A325 currently has this capability. In the software VTAP to hardware VTAP use case, let's say we have a hypervisor on the left that needs to communicate from the virtual world out to the physical world. Could be a bare metal server, physical firewalls or physical routers, you could use this tunnel from the software VTAP that terminates to the hardware VTAP to provide connectivity. Examples of products that are capable of doing this are HPE, Distributed Cloud Networking and VMware NSX. In a VXLAN deployment of centralized control plane, we have VTAPs that are controlled by a centralized controller cluster. Examples of this are HPE Distributed Cloud Networking and VMware NSX. The controllers are typically VMs and they cluster together for high availability. To ensure if one VM fails, the controller cluster still stays up. So OVSDB and NetConf are examples of the protocols used between the controller and the hardware VTAP to set up the VXDN tunnel between the software and hardware VTAP and to share MAC address so that the software VTAP knows the MAC address of this bare metal server, for example, behind VTAP B. It is also possible to deploy VXLAN without a centralized control plane. These VXLAN tunnels can be set up manually via CLI or 
dynamically through a protocol such as MPBGP eVPN. MPBGP eVPN is the recommended control plane for production networks because it's resilient, efficient, secure, scalable, and open standards based. Because it's distributed, you have to configure every device individually. Right? And if one device fails, it does not bring down the rest of the fabric. So EVPN is a control plane that supports multiple data planes. But for us in the data center, for Aruba, we are focused on network virtualization overlay and VXLAN. So let's compare static VXLAN versus EVPN VXLAN. On this slide, we have a sample config for VTAP1 with static VXLAN. Basically configure the VLANs globally. Configure the interface VXLAN, specify a source IP, typically the loopback IP, bring it up, and we do a VNI to VLAN mapping, right? And specify the remote peers. So this is VTAP2 and VTAP3. Do the same for the other VNI. So with this, the tunnels will be built manually, one by one. So at VTAP2, we need to do the same, right? Source IP will be 2.2.2.2. And the peers will be VTAP1 and VTAP3. So those are the static VXLAN tunnels that are built between the VTAPs. As for MAC, Flood and Learn, this is what happens when the VM sends a bump traffic, your know, broadcast, unknown unicast, or multicast traffic. VTAP1 learns about it and he will flood through the tunnel, through the data plane tunnel, to all remote VTAPs with the same VNI. You can see that VTAP3 has the MAC address table of the remote MAC addresses 9900 is learned through VTAP2, 9980 is learned through VTAP1. With eVPN, it provides the dynamic VXLAN tunnels and scalable control plane. I have a sample config for VTAP1 shown. You still need to enable the global VLANs, but you do need to enable eVPN that maps to the VLANs. Route distinguisher, route target can be left as auto. So that's required for each VLAN. Interface VXLAN, you do need to specify a source IP, which is the loopback, the same. Bring it up. The manual mapping of the VNI to VLAN is still required, but there's no need to specify all the remote peers any longer. So for example, if there are 20 remote peers or 50 remote peers, you do not need to specify them here. So those are learned through the MPBGP eVPN address family. So it's really more scalable and less chance for human command line error. On each VTAP, you basically just need to peer to the two route reflectors. There's no need to peer to all other VTAPs. So basically just two remote peers in a typical deployment. And with that, the tunnels can be built dynamically between the VTAPs because of this eVPN address happening and appearing. As long as two VTAPs are interested in the same VNI, a tunnel will be formed. And for a scalable control plane, this is what happens. A VTAP will learn about its locally connected hosts or VMs. Once it learns about it, it will advertise it to all other remote VTAPs that have an interest in the same VNI. So 9980, VTAP 1 learns about it. He will share that as a BGP, MP BGP control plane update to VTAP 2 and VTAP 3. So if VTAP 3 learns about his locally connected VM, 9940, he will also send that update to inform other VTAPs such as VTAP 1 and VTAP 2. So that's the difference. You do not need to wait for a broadcast to learn about MAC addresses. They are learned locally and then shared to remote peers. In the show MAC address table, we see that 9800 on VTAP 3 is learned through VTAP number 2, 9900. Same for 9980, it has a next hop of VTAP 1's IP. 
and a 40 is local through this interface 1114. Let's take a look at eVPN Mac Learning, Neighbor Discovery, Tunnel Establishment next. We have VTAP1 here that's connected to VM1. VM1 has Mac1 and IP1. It is placed into VNI10 and has next hop local. So he will send this update to the other VTAP. Because VTAP2 also has VNI10 configured, he will build this tunnel. Two VTAPs will build a tunnel when they share an interest in a similar VNI. So VTAP2 receives that information, MAC1, IP1, VNI10. The difference is an XHOP. You can see an XHOP is actually the remote VTAP. So what happens if a VM migrates between different VTAPs? Like this. VTAP2 will learn about it. Update his table, next hop local. He will send an update to all other interested VTAPs. And they will actually update their table to a new next hop. So VTAP1 now knows this MAC and this IP on VNI10 has next hop of VTAP2. So how does VX actually forward traffic? Let's take a look. We have VM1 trying to send traffic to VM2 that's connected to VTAP2. This Gray is the original traffic. VTAP1 receives it. And VTAP1 knows to get to MAC2 with IP2. Next hop is VTAP2. He will take that information and encapsulate the original traffic with this additional traffic and forward it to VTAP2. So the source MAC is VTAP1. Destination MAC is the next hop. And underlay the source IP is VTAP1, destination IP is VTAP2. As VNI also attached to this, VTAP2 receives it. And he looks at his table, he knows that MAC2 is local, VNI10, and he knows the port, send it out. And he will de encapsulate information, send it to VM2. So, how is bump traffic forwarded in a VXLAN and EVPN network, bump or broadcast unknown unicast and multicast traffic. It basically makes use of EVPN type 3, inclusive multicast information to forward that traffic. Let's take a look. VM1 sends out bump traffic. VTAP1 receives it. The broadcasts are flooded on the ports with the same VNI on VTAP1. And he will take that traffic and Form a hit and replication, basically convert it to unicast to forward out all other VTAPs that are interested in the same VNI. And split horizon is used by VXLAN to prevent frames receive bump traffic received from being sent back out into tunnels to other VTAPs.